Talking about the worst episode of Hot D is like discussing the worst ice cream flavour. Or bean chili! They're all delicious. The acting, directing and production remained stellar throughout the season, and the writing was mostly great. Mostly. I had issues with Kristen Cole slapping up Joffrey and then getting away with it, the rushed pacing of episode 6, Lena's awkward suicide by Dragon, but they all pale in comparison to episode 9, The Green Council. 9 was always a script that we very much enjoyed. I will not have it! Did you hear me, boy? I will not have it! I will not have this. This is Fantasy Haven, your home for all things fantasy. Let's dive straight into it. So, where do I even begin? This episode is confusing and awkward, badly paced, and features one of the most disappointing adaptations from one of the best moments in Fire and Blood. And I'm not even talking about this scene. To find out what went wrong, we've got to go to the source. Don't worry, this video won't spoil any future plot points in Hot D. In the description I have a link to a petition to catapult Sarah Hess into an active volcano for daring to besmirch the holy texts of George R. R. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We're not here to nitpick, we're not here for rage bait, we want to constructively criticise this amazing show so it gets even better in the future. There's no need for season 8 comparisons or petitions to fire people or personal attacks. Unless they're aimed at Crimby Cole. It is the only thing I have to fucking name. So, the episode begins in the early hours of the morning. Viserys is dead. An urgent council meeting is called, but Alison is shocked to discover that most of the council have been having lads nights in Otto's man cave and plotting to steal the throne from Rhaenyra. Beesbury is even more shocked, but is soon sat down to death by Christinus Colacus, who becomes the new Lord Commander after Harold Westling leaves the sesh early without buying around. Otto wants to assassinate Rhaenyra, but Alison refuses. This triggers a race against time to find Aegon and influence him. Alicent sends Sir Criston and Aemond, Otto sends the Cargill twins. Soon enough, Mysaria bribes Otto with his own grandson in exchange for some policy U-turns. Or are you simply a further peel in this stinking onion? Somebody. Honestly, I can't believe Viserys campaigned against lobbying and allows this to happen, it's just a scrap. Team Alicent catch Aegon first, and this means Rhaenyra won't be assassinated for some reason. Alicent fails to persuade Rhaenys, succeeds in standing up to Otto, and relaxes after a hard day by visiting her only fan for a friendly chat by the fire. The White Worm gets burnt to the ground, Aegon becomes crowned, and Rhaenys doesn't do anything controversial. At all. <sighs> Let's do this. In Fire and Blood, Viserys' corpse is discovered by a servant delivering wine, who immediately tells Alicent. The royal bedroom is sealed shut, and the servant is taken into custody to prevent the news from spreading. The small council is hastily summoned in the Queen's chambers. Otto, the Hand. Lord Jasper Wilde, the Master of Laws. Lord Lyman Beesbury, the Master of Coin. Sir Tyland Lannister, the Master of Ships. Grand Maester Orwile, and Queen Alicent herself. But that's not all. Sir Kristen Cole is already the Lord Commander when this fateful council is summoned, and Lord Lara Strong is the Master of Whispers. Grand Maester Orwa wants to inform Rhaenyra of her father's passing, but Otto shuts him down. He and Alicent want Prince Aegon to take the Iron Throne. He has no such luck with Lyman Beesbury, who stands his ground in favour of Rhaenyra. A long debate ensues, in which both sides make their case. Beesbury argues that Rhaenyra is the eldest sibling and was proclaimed the heir by King Viserys himself, who refused to change his mind despite siring sons. Oaths of fealty to Rhaenyra were spoken by all the lords and ladies of Westeros decades ago. Thanks to the quiet cowardice of Orwile, Beesbury stands alone. However, Sir Tyland argues that many who swore fealty have passed away, replaced by heirs who spoke no such vows. Lord Wilde, also known as Iron Rod, obsesses over the long-held tradition of first-born male inheritance, as well as the precedent set by the Great Council of 101. Otto declares that the true monarch would not be Rhaenyra, but her husband Daemon Targaryen, who would rule as a cruel tyrant. Alicent agrees, claiming that Rhaenyra and Daemon would order the death of her children. Even Kristen chimes in, bluntly stating that Rhaenyra's sons are bastards who would transform the keep into a brothel. Laris, curiously, says nothing the entire time. Beesbury finally has enough and rises to leave, refusing to take part in this coup. As you probably know, Fire and Blood contains multiple in-universe sources, and Lord Beesbury's fate is up for debate. One source says that Sir Otto ordered the old man to be thrown into the Black Cells, where he died of a chill. Another states that Sir Criston Cole sliced his neck open at the table there and then. One source even claims that Sir Criston grabbed him by the collar, marched him to the window, and threw him to his death below. The Greens plan for the coronation, draw up a list of potential allies, and send Sir Criston to arrest black loyalists in court. Lord Larys slices open his palm and calls for a blood oath, bonding the conspirators as they grasp each other's bleeding hands. 
The Green Council in Hot D happens in, like, five minutes? I don't know, who cares about politics and plots? Let's get to the chase scene. Whoa, look, he's running. There's a sword fight. Whoa, this is awesome. Yeah. No. This part of Fire and Blood might be my favourite, honestly. Sinister plots in the dark, debates of succession while the king rots away in his room, murder and intrigue galore. In my mind, I thought this scene would encompass half of the episode at least. You know, a long, tense, dialogue-driven bottle episode, showcasing great writing and acting. The tension would grow and grow, the elastic band would stretch and stretch before the scene snaps into sudden violence and Lord Beesbury is murdered. George, have a word with Tarantino, let him write this episode. Wait, no, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. George, no! Now, just because the scene didn't turn out how I personally imagined it doesn't make it bad. I didn't expect the crab feeder to be killed off screen, but I think it worked, honestly. Change isn't inherently bad either, obviously. Viserys is objectively a better character in the show. But this scene completely fails in its intentions. It is far too rushed and awkward to be tense. The plotting, the scheming, the debate about succession, which could have effectively showcased and summarised the arguments of both sides in a fun way, it's all reduced to a few lines of dialogue shouted off screen and cut short by constant interruptions. They're talking about the treasury and their ally- oh no, Alison's interrupted them. Oh, Beesbury and the Greens are arguing about- oh no, they're getting interrupted again. I've been waiting for Beesbury to have his dramatic moment all season, and the show was actually setting up so well, betraying him as this doddering, forgetful old man who everyone ignores and talks over. But when his time comes, nah, he barely says anything, and then he gets awkwardly sat down to death onto a metal ball. I can't believe I just said that sentence out loud. Why didn't they give him his dramatic debate? Or dramatic death? Throw him out the window, or if that's too over the top, go for the throat slash. Hell, even throwing him into the black cells would have felt more impactful and scary. This death is just so... <laughs> weird. <laughs> Everyone just sort of ignores him afterwards. Alison doesn't even support the coup at first, but Beesbury's killed and she just rubs her face like, Oh, what a day I'm having. Oh, this sucks. I can't believe you've done this. Do they want to make Sir Chungus less villainous by turning the murder into a kind of manslaughter? I mean, he's already more villainous at this point than his book counterpart because he murders Joffrey Lonmouth at a wedding, instead of killing him at a tourney, where there's plausible deniability. Calls everybody in the room a liar and a traitor and then, and then dies for it, but goes out in a very unexpected but I think honourable way. Speaking of awkward, Sir Harold has been turned into an actual character in the show, which means he's still alive by this point. I like this idea in theory, but obviously it wouldn't make sense for his character to support the coup, so he just leaves. Where's he going? Are they going to stop him or...? No? Okay then. This is of the utmost secrecy, no one can leave- Oh yeah, Harold, you can go home if you want, it's fine. We're gonna hang a distant lord in public later anyway, so whatever. Oh, in case you're wondering, I'll get into Alicent later. Which is probably what Christian wants to do as well, let's be honest. Hot D Season 1 is only based on around 60 pages or so of Fire of Blood. For context, Episode 8 covers the span of, like, three pages. The Green Council, not the episode, but the council meeting itself, is five entire pages of description and dialogue. The writers managed to craft a complex season out of a bare-bones story, and then adapt the most detailed section into an awkward, underwhelming episode. How is that even possible? I'm more impressed than annoyed, like, well, well done, I guess. Instead of abrupt interruptions and references to long-laid plans, I wanted to experience these people actually plotting and scheming and discussing their course of action. I wanted to see the debate unfold, the strengths and flaws of both sides laid bare. This should have been the tense focal point of the episode, not that goofy-ass chase scene. Don't underestimate your audience, Hot D. We don't just want chases and fights, we enjoy dialogue, we enjoy politicking when it's done right. Now, as I said before, change isn't inherently good or bad, it just is. There's some decent changes here. Uh, the lack of Laris is an interesting touch. In the show, he's not even the Master of Whispers. He's Alison's supposed lackey. And I'm glad that they removed the blood oath scene. <laughs> Can you imagine Hot D Otto agreeing to cut his palm and hold this greasy dickhead's hand just because he said so? Yeah, no. And all while being all in on the conspiracy, as opposed to a spineless weasel who gets peer pressured, I guess that kind of helps to streamline things. Oh yeah, it's not really relevant, but this ball roll is just so satisfying. Now, I could forgive the pacing here if the rest of the episode was good. Episode 6, also written by Sarah Hess, who wrote this one, it's rushed, but it sort of had to be rushed. It was cramming in a lot of plot points, and honestly, it did a good job in my opinion. But, we rushed this important scene in order to dive into an unnecessarily lengthy and goofy Scooby-Doo chase. Are you kidding me? Gotta catch them all. In Fire and Blood, Queen Alicent dispatches the five Kingsguard in the Red Keep to summon Aemond and Aegon. Aemon is training in the courtyard, but Aegon is nowhere to be found. As usual, the different sources have different stories. 
The virtuous Septon Eustace claims that Aegon was spending time with a wealthy paramour, while the salacious mushroom accuses the prince of being drunk and naked in a rat pit, watching two children fight each other while a young girl pleasured him. It's worth noting, by the way, that neither of the sources were actually there. Either way, Aegon is reluctant to be king, arguing that his elder sister is the heir. Criston persuades him otherwise. Does he want to be executed by Rhaenyra? Does he want her bastard sons to take precedence over him? He finally capitulates. In Hot D, I'm not gonna lie, I don't know what the hell is going on. I'm fallen! So, Aegon is missing because he's a drunk scoundrel and two teams are dispatched to find him. The hunt for Aegon is too long, too confusing, and everyone is walking around in these dumb outfits. It's half a page in Fire and Blood, it didn't need to drag out like this. Why is he wearing that hat? Honestly, this episode kind of makes Aemond not cool like he was in the previous one. The bit where he just stands still and starts expositing about wanting to be king. Desire the younger brother who studies history and philosophy. Desire who trains with the sword, who rides the largest dragon in the world. Desire- uh, Eric, Oric, uh, Eric, uh, Eric, uh, thing one and thing two, that's it. How are we meant to tell the difference? Like, I get it, they're identical twins and there's a story reason for this, but it was kind of important for the audience to understand who was who. I mean, this is the only time they're not in identical Kingsguard armour. They could literally be wearing anything and the costume department gave them the same look. <laughs> Why? Luckily for everyone, Mizari is here to cut it short. Viceroy Gunray negotiates directly with Otto I Cuntanobi, offering Aegon's location in exchange for the banning of child fighting pits. Wait, why is he still wearing his pin under the <laughs> under the disguise? Everything about this section just feels off. This is getting out of hand. Now there are two of them. The negotiations were short. I like the change to Mizari actually. Yeah, yeah, her accent sucks, but I do like the woman of the people with a vast spy network approach. Her spy Talia is a cool addition too. Hmm, I wonder how she got the role. So Aemond and Christonosaurus Rex conveniently stumble upon the meeting and catch Thing 1 and Thing 2. Why are you running? Why are you running? A badly choreographed fight ensues and then, wait, uh, slow down, slow down. Why is this happening again? I really don't get the logic of this. Why does it matter who catches him first? Alison is still the queen, Otto is still the hand, they're clearly organising things for Aegon. Why do they need to find him first to have influence over him? Otto wants me to order the assassination of Rhaenyra, but my mum's bodyguard found me this morning instead of the bodyguard my grandfather sent, so I guess I'll negotiate instead. <laughs> like, what? The peace terms Alison proposes this episode aren't even the same as the ones Otto presents in episode 10. She wants Rhaenyra's family to go into exile peacefully, but the next episode Otto talks about keeping her as Lady of Dragonstone, and so on. Anyway, Aemond and Kristen caught him first. Hooray, I guess. I have no wish to rule, no taste for duty, I'm not suited. I don't want it. The fighting pit reveal links with Mushroom's account from Fire and Blood, which I'm surprised they went with. Don't worry, I've got a section about Aegon coming up later in this video. What's more surprising is the omission of Kristen Cole, well, doing anything useful. All season, let's be honest. He starts out as this mysterious character, a potential love interest, but then he shows his dark side. He joins the Greens, desperate to serve who he perceives to be a virtuous noble lady, unlike that harlot Rhaenyra. But after joining the Greens, he becomes irrelevant. Genuinely, what does he contribute to anything? He's not even the Lord Commander at the start of this episode, so it's not like his presence legitimises the coup. In Fire and Blood, he rolls a nat 20 in Persuasion and gets the reluctant Aegon to betray his sister. For this reason, and because he personally crowns Aegon, he becomes known as the Kingmaker. Yeah, in the show he crowns Aegon, but that's not the point of his moniker. Hell, Hot D actually set this up better than the book because he's presented as a potential father figure to the Targaryen princes, training and siding with them while Visity basically ignores them. Are they seriously going to call him the Kingmaker? The Lord Commander who betrayed the rightful queen? The King's Guard who broke his neutrality for personal and political reasons. Just because he put a crown on Aegon's head? Honestly, I think this can be rectified in Season 2. Just have Aegon experience a crisis of faith, perhaps he's close to abdicating to stop the war, and then Kristen persuades him otherwise. You know, give, give the sea man something to do, at least. Anyway, Aegon gets coronated and it looks cool and the episode ends. Imp's delight out of 15 marks. Thanks for watching, bye. Alright, fine, I'll talk about Rainies. In Fire and Blood, the Greens plot for several days before Aegon is even crowned, sending letters to their allies while Viserys' stench fills the Red Keep. At last, the time comes. Horsemen ride through King's Landing, bellowing the death of Viserys and the ascension of Aegon. Some weep, some cheer, but most are just confused. Some even call out for Queen Rhaenyra. Prince Aegon is taken to the Dragon Pit and crowned King Aegon II, with Aegon the Conqueror's steel circlet, placed upon him by Lord Commander Criston Cole. Alicent places her own crown on her daughter, Queen Helena. Eustace says the dragon pit was teeming, while Mushroom claims it was half empty. 
After the coronation, Aegon mounts his beautiful gold dragon, Sunfire, and rides back to the Red Keep. In Hot D, the coronation seemingly takes place the day of the coup. It's swift and efficient, although I do miss the dark concept of Viserys rotting away, surrounded by incense, while politicians and bureaucrats scheme in the shadows. It feels like a wasted opportunity, but then again, they only have 10 episodes, things have to be sacrificed. The coronation itself is awesome, honestly, I think it's the best part of the episode. It looks amazing and I love the choreography of it. Aegon's looking pretty fly for a Valyrian guy, if you ask me. Yeah, he's wearing black, but you know, he's in mourning, I'll allow it. I would have liked a bit more green in this episode. Really sending mixed messages with these outfits, guys. How Otto only really cares about one kind of green in this episode. Smoke weed every day. Aegon is affected by the audience's declaration of love. Love he never received from his father, or even his mother. This shines a more sympathetic light on- Actually, no, I don't care, because he watches children literally fight to the death. What I don't like, however, is the unanimous reaction of the crowd. The dragon pit is stuffed, and pretty much everyone is cheering and applauding. It's like they've all just forgotten about Rhaenyra. The whole point of this conflict is that the realm is divided. In the book, you've got some of the small folk cheering for Aegon, others calling out for Rhaenyra. It's clearly a reference to the civil war between King Stephen and Empress Matilda. Is this just an unfortunate omission from the script, or is it a deliberate change to show that the small folk are all evil, sexist pigs who don't want a woman on the throne? If it's the latter, then, well, that's an unnecessary removal of nuance from an otherwise pretty nuanced show. It is a shame that Sunfire isn't there. I would have loved to see him in all his golden glory. But that's a nitpick, they didn't have the budget for another dragon at the end of this episode. What the fuck do you- what do you mean? How? How have you- Ah oh, man, what? You're just ruining it! You're ru- look at my lips, you're ruining it! Ruining! Ruining- This ending seemed to give people bad flashbacks to some of the dodgier scenes from Game of Thrones. The ones that prioritised mindless, big budget spectacle and action over logic and internal consistency. Like Cersei committing Great Theft 9-11 and facing literally zero consequences. Rhaenys bursts up through the floor, slaughtering hundreds if not thousands of innocent small folk. Faces off against the high tires, the high tires? Faces off against the high towers, decides to spare them, and then flies away. Many fans have complained that this ruined Rhaenys' character. She's now a mass murderer, and even worse, it's not even addressed in episode 10. And despite this, she spares the high towers, making the dramatic entrance completely pointless and ultimately allowing the war to break out. Many consider this to be the worst moment of season one. I disagree, I think the Green Council is worse as a book reader, but I do get why people are frustrated. There's a podcast called The Longest Night. The host Rob guides his friend Lizzie through every episode of Game of Thrones, which she hasn't seen before. Unlike most people who talk about Game of Thrones online, he loves the later seasons as much as the first, and he thought that the show ended well. From season 5 onwards, I basically stop agreeing with half of what he says, and he's a little bit insulting towards book fans who dislike the show, but he produces great content in my opinion. There's one thing he said that really stuck with me. It's that fans need to stop saying, how dare the writers do this, and start asking, why did the writers do this? Doesn't mean we have to like it, but we do need to explore the creative reasons behind the decisions we dislike. So, with that in mind, in Inside the Episode, Miguel Sapochnik said that the episode needed more. We gotta do better than this. We needed a penultimate scene. What's the worst thing that could possibly happen in the coronation and realise that it was a dragon? So Sarah Hess, who wrote the script, must have ended the episode on the coronation, but Big Mig didn't think it was epic enough, so it was rewritten. The addition of this ending may have trimmed other scenes, resulting in the awkward pacing. Perhaps it's the reason why the Green Council is cut so short. Sarah Hess describes the moment as awesome, and Condal describes it as heroic and triumphal. Triumph- is that even a word? Oh shit, it is. Okay, well now I look stupid. So clearly the three of them considered this scene to be an empowering, epic moment that we're all supposed to cheer for. Mass murder is badass. Careful now, girl. I enjoy you, but be careful. The inside the episode claims that the script said that Rhaenys bursts out of the floor, and so then the VFX team had to work out the logistics of that. So it's less, Rhaenys destroys a bunch of innocents, and more, Awesome girl boss moment, oh I guess some people need to die logically, VFX can sort that out. Hess dismissively said that they were civilians so it doesn't count, which is pretty silly considering the lives of innocents is kind of a big deal in the stories within this universe, is kind of the point. It's ironic they spend so much time and resources on creating this big scene because the coronation wasn't enough, only for fans to then hate it and wish the episode had ended on the coronation. However, we must give the showrunners the benefit of the doubt. These controversial comments are all out of context statements in interviews and inside the episode marathons. You can't assume that they're as dismissive or unaware as they're presenting themselves. There's a chance that the massacre is intentional, 
Yes, it does make Rhaenys look powerful, but it's also a symbol of how little the nobles care for the small folk, and it may be foreshadowing a certain event in the future that I won't spoil. Perhaps they plan to address this in Season 2. Okay, enough of the diplomacy, you want to know my opinion, don't you? I think it was kind of dumb. I suspect it was an unnecessary attempt to have an epic girl power moment and a shocking big budget ending crafted for Burlington Bar type reactions that then backfired in their faces. At least your balls will not freeze off. The coronation would have been a great ending. I like Rhaenys' character, but I can't view her the same way now. It's not even that I see her as a mass murderer, which itself doesn't suit her at all and flies in the face of all of the she would have been a better monarch than Viserys bullshit. No, it's that when I see her, I can't imagine this scene even being canon. It doesn't feel real. Damon is likeable because he's consistent. We know he's a villainous scumbag. Rhaenys is not. She's not presented that way. The creators don't talk about her that way, and they don't seem to be aware of what they've done with her by making her massacre all those people. It just didn't need to happen. I was already not vibing with the episode, and then the coronation happened, and I thought, weakest episode so far, but this is a good ending. And then the Rhaenys thing kind of ruined it. It's one thing to dislike a creative decision, but it's another thing when the creators don't seem to realise the decision that they've made. I'm fine with her sparing the high towers, by the way. She says in episode 10 that it's not her war to begin, which is kind of strange because her granddaughters are married to Rhaenyra's heirs, but killing the high towers would still be kinslaying. I get why she doesn't want to kill her own family. But if I'm wrong, and this was intentional and is going to be addressed, I'm going to say it's wrong, and I'm going to sing its praises, if it's done well. <sighs> Time to wind down with a sponsorship. I am proud to tell you about DZ Season 1, the new fashion line by Damon Targaryen. Big D pioneered this look after realising that most of his peasant fans couldn't afford luxury clothes. The Season 1 range includes the Crime Cloak, the Heinous Hoodie, and the Dastardly Disguise. You can buy these in grey and beige, but for a limited time only, if you click the link below, click the link, if you click the link below, you can get half price off their latest product, the dumb hat. <laughs> or you could support the channel by liking and subscribing so I can get actual sponsors. Nah, that's not as fun, is it? Anyway, moving on. You might have noticed that I've avoided talking about Alison in depth. I still have mixed opinions about her role this season. I enjoy that she's not just Rhaenyra's evil stepmother, but I feel like they went too far in making her sympathetic, to the point where she spends much of the entire season as a passive observer, with a few moments that feel like she's coming into her own to take control, but then she just doesn't. Episode 5 she emerges in the green dress, but 10 years later we learn that she hasn't made any allies at court except this weirdo. And then at the end of episode 7 she snaps and Otto praises her, and in episode 8 she's helping her father run the court, but it turns out she doesn't even know about the coup. I get it, she's meant to be somewhat passive because she's a lost and lonely woman in a medieval patriarchy, but she can still have agency in not having agency. In following the traditions and customs of Westeros that result in her playing a more passive role in society by being more involved in the coup and court politics as a whole. Does that, does that make sense? Nah, we can't have Alison building up a court faction and launching the coup for her own complex personal and political reasons. No, she has to be a poor, innocent, passive, naive observer while evil, dumb men force her to be ruthless. I don't know, it feels a little bit infantilizing. I'm not saying she has to be fire and blood ruthless. In fact, they've swapped Alison and Otto around a bit. In the book, it's Otto calling for peace and negotiations. She finally gets her taking control moment again, by capturing Aegon first, standing up to Otto, organising the coronation and so on, but we've already had this moment before. I hope she starts getting down to business next season. She doesn't have to be a villain. I think she's way more interesting in Hot D, but I just want her to be more involved, to do more, to have more agency. Wait a minute. Did someone say villain? Do you love me? Are you playing your love games with me? I just wanna know. I really don't like what they've done with Aegon. In Fire and Blood, he starts off as a lazy, spoiled brat. His first redeeming action is when he initially refuses to take the throne because he doesn't want to betray his sister. It's the threat of literal death that sways him. Young Hot D Aegon is similar. I actually really like his characterization in episode 6 and 7. He's a bored pervert and a bully, but he has a likeable honesty. He's just a bored dude. I was expecting the show to keep this general characterization, but take it down a somewhat darker path. I just wasn't expecting the path to become pitch black. I mean, he outright assaults a presumably underage maid. I get that it isn't presented as a sadistic thing, it comes across more like a spoiled idiot who doesn't understand consent, but even so, way more grim than the groping that's mentioned in Fire and Blood, and even that's pretty grim. Now, this isn't the issue I have, I don't mind a darker Aegon, but the child fighting pits for me is too much, it's comically villainous. You're telling me he watches children with filed teeth fight to the death 
for fun. Not only that, one of his bastard sons takes part. Of all of Mushroom's stories to go with, they went with the child fighting pits. Okay, the nuance is gone now. He's just an outright evil sadist. The blacks versus greens thing is solved. It's Rhaenyra, who's a full person, versus this guy. It's over. It's over. In Fire and Blood, it's clear that Germ has a preference for the blacks, and I expected the greens to be more sympathetic in the show, to make things more interesting, but no, they're somehow more villainous, with the specific exception of Alison, of course. This is similar to the Rainies thing. If they're gonna make a decision I dislike, I wanna know the reasoning. But if they don't seem to realize what they've done, then I'm concerned. Because people have come out and said, he's not a sadist, he's not Joffrey, we don't wanna make the same kind of character, he's misunderstood and sympathetic. No, he stopped being sympathetic the moment we found out he watches his own bastard son fight to the death with filed teeth. Why did they go so extreme? It makes the conflict way more boring. It's basically just heroic Rhaenyra versus evil brother at this point. No, you don't understand, he watches child torture because uh, he was neglected as a kid and uh, his father didn't uh, love him and uh, I hope he gets better characterization next season. Just retcon the pit stuff, honestly. No taste for duty, I'm not suited! Alright, this is a part where I stop being a moaning little bitch. What did I enjoy about the episode? The opening scene is masterful and atmospheric. The direction and cinematography is mostly great, with the exception of this fight scene. It goes without saying, the acting remains fantastic all across the board. I know I dunked on Eamon earlier, but I love the emotion on his face when he comes to see Helena. I like the attempt to show the court purge, even if the execution wasn't brilliant. Man, it's gotta be hard purging the blacks and promoting the greens when everyone's wearing the same fucking colour. Another one of these show trials, the High Towers really do like their staged events. It's a nice touch to have blacks who stand their ground, blacks who bend the knee out of fear, and even Lord Caswell who plays along to act later. Unfortunately, they decided to make him an idiot. Where are you riding to? I hate Rhaenyra, she sucks. Yeah, but... Where are you riding to? Damn it, you got me. Like, why did he just stand in silence? Did he not think of a single excuse? Wait, I'm supposed to be talking about positive stuff. Most of Alison's scenes are actually great. I mean, it's Olivia Cook, of course it's great. The way she was laying on the charm for Rhaenys. Nice try, bitch. I love seeing her stand up to Otto. It was really satisfying, and I'm genuinely excited to see how their relationship evolves next season. I also really like the scene with Laris. In episode six, after the 10 year time skip, she visits Laris and takes her shoes off to show how comfortable she is in his presence. It's been six years and she's comfortable enough to take her stockings off and get snug on the sofa, displaying how their friendship has grown into a healthy, um, wait, wait, no, 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 Laris. Laris no. I need to have a look at those feet. I hate this man. This is the dude who rocks up to the party and ruins the entire mood and no one knows who even invited him. I know everyone made a meme about the foot thing, but I'm surprised people interpreted this moment as a reveal of Laris's motivations. As I said in my episode 9 review, if Laris were paid in gold coins, no one would be saying, oh, his motivation is gold, that's boring. No, it's clearly a bunch of stuff. The feet thing is his payment, of course, but it's also his way of exerting control over her. Honestly, the actor Matthew Needham said it better than I ever could, so I'm just going to read this out. It's not just about a man with a club foot being attracted to feet. It's that he can make her do it. This is a very disturbed person with a lot of trauma. It's about making her feel as much shame as she does for that part of her body as he does for his. He can cut out tongues and he can cut out eyes. I think he likes that. I think he likes making people incomplete. He can't do that with her. He can, though, associate that part of her body with a trauma so that long after he's gone, she's got this sick feeling about it that's connected to that. That's the thing about a sort like that. It makes the victim's body the scene of the crime, and I think that's what he likes to do. So I don't see it like he loves feet. It's the fact that she's not into it, and he can make her do it. I'm super excited to see what the clubfoot gets up to next season. It seems like he tried to take a queen off the chessboard, so perhaps he will merge his firefly pawns with Mizaria's spy network to become a bishop? Oh god, I suck at chess analogies. Just to clarify, there's lots of good dialogue here. Sarah Hess is a good writer. All of the writers are good for the most part, just like this show. Yes, I think episode 9 is the worst episode, but it's still above average. Let me know in the comments if you agree with me or not. But what's the best episode, I hear you ask? Well, look no further than this video. And feel free to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell to get more content like this. Take care.